Hi everyone, in this video we're going to talk about the presidency of Andrew Jackson. Uh, Andrew Jackson grew up with uh, quite a difficult childhood. His father died when he was very young. Uh, he and his brothers and his widowed mother grew up in the Carolinas. A number of his brothers died in uh, the war of uh, in the Revolutionary War. Um, he himself was captured in the War of 1812. He was struck and scarred by a British officer when he refused to shine his boots. Um, and he becomes a national hero in the, in the War of 1812 for leading the American armies uh, in, the, in the Southern Theater to defeat uh, Indian invasions from Florida and then to defeat the British attack on New Orleans. So he becomes a, a national hero. He settles in Tennessee, um, but he's still seen as an outsider. He's seen as someone who doesn't come from uh, the old school colonial aristocracies of Virginia and New York and Massachusetts. He's seen as someone who hasn't been educated in a classical way, in the way that they have been. But he becomes a very popular uh, politician. So popular that in 1824, he runs to be president and actually wins uh, the most votes. But he doesn't win a majority. He only wins a plurality. And remember, this is the Tenth Amendment that goes back to the election of 1800. In a situation where a candidate, the leading candidate, only wins a plurality, Decision over who becomes president goes to a vote in the House of Representatives. And the congressmen are very much part of this colonial aristocracy class that fear Jackson as an outsider. And so instead of voting for Jackson, they vote for John Quincy Adams, the son of the second president of the United States, John Adams. And so, again, you can see the aristocracy, the elite of New England and the coastal states against an outsider like Jackson from Tennessee. Nevertheless, this election is very much seen as kind of a despicable backroom deal by a lot of people who had voted for Jackson. It means that John Quincy Adams faces a lot of opposition. It means that when Jackson runs against him again in 1828, he is successful and he becomes president. He becomes president and he's also formed a new party, a new political party that broke away from the Republicans that called themselves the Democrats. And this was a big part of the culture of politics that Andrew Jackson uh, demonstrates and reveals. A culture in politics that emphasized the participation of ordinary people. And that's why they're calling themselves Democrats. They're saying that they are a voice for ordinary people voting rather than Congress voting for the president because there's been a contested election. And so Jackson comes to power with uh, this new party, this new focus on a growing electorate. This was a time when property requirements for voting were shrinking so that basically by the end of the Jacksonian era, within 10 years of Jackson's victory, everyone who was a white male uh, would be able to vote unprecedented in the Western world at the time uh, shows this process of democratization that people see taking place in the United States in the 19th century. And so now there's a focus on all white males uh, being able to vote. It means that campaigning and being a political candidate is something that requires much more popular appeal than it had before. This voting isn't just seen as something that elites do. Political campaigning isn't something that's seen as undignified. And instead, casting yourself as a man of the people is becoming increasingly crucial to success. And this is why Jackson is successful. He portrays himself as an ordinary outsider trying to represent ordinary people as their president. And we're going to see this in Jackson's government of the United States. He's going to be a nationalist. He's going to promote the authority of the federal government but only insofar as it integrates the different states within the country together. So every time the authority of the federal government is questioned, he's going to support it. But otherwise, he's going to minimize federal involvement in people's everyday lives. I hope that distinction makes sense. 
Jackson wants there to be a federal government, wants there to be a United States. And so he's going to promote efforts to bring the United States together. But once the United States is brought together or outside of those efforts, he's going to try and limit the influence of the government. And uh, we see this in a couple of episodes in his presidency. First of all, the nullification crisis. Um, the South, Southern states were conti continued to feel that the tariffs that protected Northern industries were unfair to them. It meant that they had to pay that much more for products that came from the North, came from these factories, while there was no tariff on outside cotton. And so this meant that uh, there was this resentment, there was this idea that the North was becoming wealthy at the expense of the South. And this comes to a head during Jackson's presidency when South Carolina threatens just to not observe these tariffs, that they're going to prevent, by force if necessary, federal officials from observing them. And uh, this is seen as a real crisis because basically if Jackson allows this to happen, he's saying that individual states can choose which parts of the Constitution that they follow. And there's this famous account of a tit for tat between Jackson and between Calhoun, this uh, senator who was originally a nationalist, but starts to drift away from nationalism in favor of states' rights when he sees that nationalism is hurting South Carolina. And they're at a dinner that's in honor of Jefferson's birthday. This uh, figure who was they see as kind of the founder of their interpretation of the Constitution and the way that it's interpreted. And at the dinner, Jackson offers a toast to the Union, the Union of the States. For Jackson, this is what's most important. And Calhoun responds by offering a toast to liberty. For Calhoun, liberty is more important than the states. And this is what gives the states, in his view, the ability to not enforce certain aspects of the Constitution that they see, or, or sorry, gives the states the authority not to enforce federal laws or mandates that they see as unconstitutional. Whereas the response of Jackson and of the Unionists, of the Nationalists, is to say the Constitution isn't determined by the states. The Union is the Union of the states, but it's determined by the Constitution, which is the Constitution of the people. So these are the two different camps here. One that says we are a federal union, united in uh, nationalism, um, united as the government of the people. You cannot choose which parts of the Constitution you follow. And the other that says we are a union of states. The states are sovereign. The states have the authority to determine which parts of the federal government, which aspects of the federal government they enforce and uh, which they don't. And Jackson, as I kind of hinted, comes down very hard in favor of the nationalists. He suggests that, and I think it's probably true, that he is willing to use force, much to the horror of states' rights activists or states' rights senators like Calhoun. He's willing to use force to enforce these tariffs. He's willing to use the military. Federal military can be used aggressively on a state to enforce these tariffs. Um, this is seen as tyranny by people like Calhoun. This is seen as a necessity for maintaining the Union by people like Jackson. And so um, in, in the end, South Carolina backs down, says that they will enforce the tariff once they get offered a better tariff by Congress. And in return, Jackson backs down on the use of military force. But again, you see the tension that exists here, the tension between states' rights and uh, between nationalism. Nationalism, in the end, is what will be successful. 